Focus on Headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, uh, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters, Hong Bo-kyung and Kwon Soa. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. And for Bo-kyung, Happy New Year's to you. Thank you. Happy New Year's to you. It's been a week since we last saw, (laughs) back where we're in our mask once again. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, we're going to start things off with some domestic news first. Uh, Starting off at the National Assembly, rival parties have agreed to extend the parliamentary probe into the ETL and crowd crush. Uh, that, uh, of course, killed uh, these uh, killed 158, if you want to count the unfortunate story afterwards of uh, one of these survivors who uh, took his own life. Uh, it's 159. Uh, this, of course, during uh, act- on October 29th here. Investigations are still going on here. So uh, let's uh, talk more about this. Right. So the ruling and opposition parties held a plenary session this afternoon to vote on a 10-day extension of the parliamentary investigation period regarding the Itaewon tragedy. Among 215 attendees, 205 voted in favor of it, two against, and eight abstained. On Thursday, floor leaders Chu ho Young and Park hong of the People Power Party and Democratic Party agreed on a prolonged investigation, which has also made possible a third round of hearings regarding the incident. With that, the probe will be continuing until the 17th of this month. The originally 45-day investigation was expected to end tomorrow. There there have been calls um, for an extension as the probe's process was being delayed as Parliament was caught up with the state budget plan for 2023. However, the families of the tragic accidents victims say, say an extra 10 days were not enough in revealing the truth and demanded more time. Uh, The reason for that is uh, the representatives of the bereaved families claimed at a press briefing Thursday that more than half of the 45 days of the parliamentary probe were actually spent on political disputes over the budget bill, meaning an extension of 10 days will not even meet the originally planned 45 days. They also pointed out that high-ranking government officials are only passing the responsibility down to those that were at the scene and added that so far there was not a single official in the higher-ups that either officially acknowledged responsibility or resigned. And the families also demanded to participate as witnesses in upcoming hearings. You know, I think that's the uh, the most important thing here. First and foremost, uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, 45 days of the investigation, uh, we got little to no answers as to who's really responsible for the, uh, the tragedy there. Uh, and I know there's been, and I can't believe there's also two people who are voted against this, but if the victim's families demand that there's more days uh, put into finding out this answer and uh, that they should add more days to continue this parliamentary probe, uh, they should listen to them. I mean, this is, I mean, it's of all the people, it's the victim's families uh, that deserve the answer here. And uh, from the very start, that was uh, the also what the, uh, the, the victim's family said uh, was the big criticism from the get-go is that uh, the high-ranking of government officials are kind of passing down the responsibility that was down to those that were at the scene. And one of those people, of course, we talked about was the Yongsan-gu uh, Fire Department Chief, right? Uh, Che sung bum who everyone was saying, we have no idea why you guys are questioning him. If anything, he was the only one that was down there, uh, really trying to get things done here. Uh, but nevertheless here, uh, today was also the second day of the sp- uh, Special Parliamentary Committee investigation hearing. Uh, there were many, many grilling uh, put on the interior and safety minister, of course, he was uh, at the center of the big controversy, the uh, the main opposition Democratic Party calling him to resign uh, or even asking uh, President Yoon Sagyar and his administration to, of course, uh, fire him. That never came about. But what was the stance uh, during his uh, hearing there? Right. So as you know, the first hearing was held on Wednesday with senior ranking police officers having been summoned, including the National Police Chief Yoon hee and ex-chief of Yongsan Poli- Police, Lee im And now in today's second hearing of the Special Parliamentary Committee, minister-level witnesses were summoned, including the Interior and Safety Minister Lee Sang-min, Health Minister Chu 
Chu Kyu Hong, Cho Chu Kyu Hong, sorry, as well as Seoul Mayor Oh Se Hoon and Yongsan Ward Office Chief Park Ki Young. In the hearing, Minister Lee bowed and apologized in front of the bereaved families, saying he will do his best to communicate with the families and provide support. Also, despite the opposition lawmakers calling for his resignment, he reaffirmed that he does not have the intention of stepping down from the post. When asked whether this was his or President Yoon's intention, he answered that it is no one's intention but his commitment and determination. Seoul Mayor Oh Se-hun said that there are 60 manuals for natural and social disasters, so it is difficult for the officials to be fully aware of all the manuals. He said that a common manual should be developed, and he also said that he will comprehensively examine new disaster situations and push for a revision of law to cover any gray area areas, such as events being held without organizers. Well, the problem is, I mean, there might be 60 manuals for natural and social disasters, but I think the big criticism uh, leading up to this uh, tragedy was the fact that despite the fact that they knew that this was going to, this Itaewon festivities in uh, Itaewon was going to garner Many, many people. We're talking about over 100,000 people. We know the alleyways of Itaewon can get very crowded, even without uh, Halloween festivities going on. And the fact that there was no measures in place uh, is the big thing here, which is why I think those that were sort of in charge of that, we're talking about uh, Yongsan D- District Ward Chief uh, Park Ki Young. Also, I mean, a lot of people are saying, well, with Seoul Mayor uh, Oh Se-hoon, him being sort of in charge of the Seoul city in itself, there should have been some kind of uh, measures in place here, uh, which is why those are uh, some of the people that have been facing the grilling today. But uh, during the hearing, the health minister said that the victims and bereaved families uh, can receive psychological support even if they refuse before what is what is this about right so during the second hearing held today the minister of health and welfare Chu gyu hong was asked whether psychological support was being appropriately provided to the victims and bereaved families and as you know a student who had survived from the yongsan crowd crush was later found dead apparently because of suffering from trauma and minister cho said that victims and families can receive psychological support anytime even even if they have refused to do so before. He said that the ministry had already reached out to those affected based on their contact information. So uh, the other criticism with this, uh, again, yes, uh, there was apparently some psychological assistance and support uh, for the uh, survivors of the 1029 tragedy. But I believe, if I'm not wrong here, uh, the parents of the student who course uh, took his own life uh, after um, again facing incredible trauma from seeing both uh, two of his I believe two of his friends right. uh, you know dying from the tragedy said basically said that yes there was psychological support but it wasn't enough there's a certain amount of time that was given and it's not enough support and so forth and so now uh, the biggest thing is and, and uh, I hate to say this we learn always after when a tragedy happens right and so now uh, we're hoping that uh, the government or you know any of the officials or authorities that are able to give proper and uh, uh, and sufficient amount of su- uh, support uh, for the victims I think that's the important thing uh, now that we have the uh, parliamentary investigative committee and their probe into the 1029 tragedy being extended for 10 days. To be honest with you, I think it needs more than 10 days. And if the uh, the family believes that they need more 10 days, it should be extended for however long until they get the answer. But we'll continue to keep a close eye here. Uh, let's move on here to foreign affairs and security issues. The U.S. and Japan expected to hold a 2 plus 2 meeting next week in Washington. This just ahead of the bilateral U.S.-Japan summit that we also talked about earlier this week. So fill us in on this. Right. The U.S. State Department on Thursday local time announced that the two allies, the U.S. and Japan, will co-host the 2023 U.S.-Japan Security Consultative Committee meeting in Washington, D.C. on the 11th this month, which will be Wednesday. And this meeting is also often referred to as the 2 plus 2 meeting, where the foreign and defense chiefs of the two nations get together. Uh, So that would be U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, and on the Japanese side, Minister of Foreign Affairs Yoshi 
Yoshimasa Hayashi and Minister of Defense Yasukazu Hamada. Uh, spokesperson Ned Price said uh, from the U.S. State Department, of course, uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance remains the cornerstone of a free and open Indo-Pacific region. And uh, he said that the two countries will discuss their shared vision of a so-called modernized alliance that will tackle 21st century challenges in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. Price added that North Korea will be on the agenda, and when asked about whether China could be a topic, he said, quote, I would expect that there will be discussion of the challenges that are presented by China. Uh, in its release on the meeting, Japan's foreign ministry this Friday said the four ministers will discuss the security challenges facing the two countries based on the strategic documents of the respective countries, as well as future cooperation on realizing a, quote, free and open Indo. Pacific. In the meantime, uh, there is a birthday coming up. Uh, it is going to be the birthday of North Korea's leader Kim Jong Un. Um, are we expecting any kind of military level celebrations here, uh, Po Gyeong? Right. So, as you said, Kim Jong Un is turning 39 this coming Sunday, which is January 8th. As you know, Pyongyang usually carries out large maneuvers on important anniversaries of the North Korean communist regime. In fact, it was observed that some preparations were being made since last month, with more than 10,000 troops gathering at one of the airports in Pyongyang. Experts said that by looking at the level of preparation, it's probably just to get ready for the 75th anniversary of the founding of the Korean People's Army, rather than celebrating Kim Jong-un's birthday. Whereas the birthdays of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-un are celebrated as the Day of the Sun and the Day of the Shining Star, Kim Jong-un's birthday is not officially celebrated yet. You're talking about uh, Kim Jong-il, right? Uh, Kim Jong-il, oh, yes, right, Kim yeah. Jong-il, sorry. And, yeah, the father of Kim Jong-un. That's right. And it was in 2014 when NBA star Dennis Rodman visited North Korea for Kim Jong-un's birthday that the date was first officially confirmed. Yeah, and um, who, who can forget uh, Dennis Rodman's happy birthday uh, singing for <laughs> Kim Jong-un, which, by the way, was... One of the worst renditions of happy birthdays out there. But uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're good friends here. Uh, but again, uh, they do usually uh, over in North Korea, they treat uh, the every fifth and every tenth anniversaries very big. And so uh, certainly maybe it probably could be the 75th uh, anniversary of the founding of the Korean People's Army uh, that they're preparing for there. But uh, we'll, I'm sure uh, they'll keep a close eye on that. Uh, other diplomatic news, it was uh, kind of a belatedly revealed uh, over in the, here in domestic media that uh, South Korean lawmakers had made a visit to uh, Taiwan late last year. In fact, we just got the news uh, not too long ago as well. Um, certainly, anytime you have uh, a country that's not only close to China, have a close relations when it comes to at least trade uh, with China, uh, that uh, it's going to cause some kind of uh, criticism from the Chinese government here. But uh, let's dive into the uh, the implications of this trip. So, uh. Right. So actually, um, after I saw the news first uh, breaking out on Korean news, I looked for up for the Taiwanese uh, articles. And uh, there were articles related to this trip already on December 31st. But actually also the Taiwanese um, government had released this uh, trip even after the Korean delegation departed. Mm. Uh, so first off, um, the CNA, which uh, is the central news agency by it's a Ty Taiwan's news agency, uh, titled this South Korean National Assembly delegation visited Taiwan and quoted the um, foreign ministry there. Mm -hmm. So a delegation led by National Assembly member and chair of the Taiwan Korean Parliamentary Friendship Group, Cho Kyung Tae, made a low profile visit between between December 28th and 31st. So they call this low profile, and I guess that's the reason for why we just hear of this a week mm -hmm. after. The Taiwanese Foreign Ministry's press release came after the Korean delegation departed, and they did not elaborate on why. Because usually if there is a trip coming up, you know, we just reported on exactly. um, the 2 plus 
two meeting, for instance, coming up next week, and we usually hear of these. Uh, it would have been an item earlier. on focus on headlines. It would have been, been, yeah, yeah, which China would not really like. But, anyways, the Taiwanese Foreign Ministry's press release came after. Uh, oh, I just <laughs> said that. But on January second, there was another article uh, by Taipei Times, which titled. Uh, the South Korea delegation made discreet unannounced visit to Taipei last week. There we have it again, uh, low profile, discreet. But it is a noteworthy trip, being the first one for South Korean parliamentarians in Taiwan since the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. Uh, the delegates met with President Tsai Ing-wen, Legislative Speaker Yu Si kun and Taiwanese Deputy Foreign Minister Tian Chung Kwang. Uh, he hosted, uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister hosted a bank Quit. And there, the two sides discussed bilateral partnerships in various areas. Taiwan's Foreign Affairs Ministry also mentioned the South Korean delegation exchanged views on cross-Taiwan strait tensions, as well as North Korea issues. And the trip comes on the heels of other parliamentarians and legislators from the U.S., Europe and Japan that, according to Taiwanese media, are displaying their support for Taiwan. And that was also the expression. Taiwan made with a visit by the Korean delegation. And uh, that support being translated as one for peace in the Taiwan Strait amid rising tensions between Taiwan and China. And uh, the visits, uh, the recent visits especially uh, seem to have uh, become more frequent after U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip last year in August that sparked anger from China. Now, here's the thing. I mean, I could kind of understand with when uh, Nancy Pelosi made the trip uh, to Taiwan, it would have, yes, it would have probably really upset uh, China. But uh, why this trip should be uh, so significant and uh, really upset China, I'm not too sure. So let's talk about this because the Chinese government did strongly protest uh, the South Korean delegation's trip to Taiwan. Um, but let's get the uh, our government's uh, response to this, uh, Po Gyeong. Right. So the Chinese embassy in Seoul made a statement yesterday regarding the recent visit, saying the visit is a serious violation of the One China policy and the spirit of the joint statement on diplomatic relations between China and South Korea. It also urged Seoul to take timely measures to alleviate the negative impact of the visit and to refrain from engaging in any, quote, official exchanges with the Taiwan region, unquote. In the meanwhile, South Korea's foreign ministry said that South Korea maintains its position of respecting the One China policy. The ministry also added that there was nothing to say on a governmental level regarding the individual activities of the lawmakers. And now, uh, Cho kyung also did a comment on his Facebook. While the government refrained from making further comments, People Power Party lawmaker Cho kyung who was a member of the delegation, slammed China on Friday for criticizing the delegation's visit to Taiwan. He wrote on Facebook that such behavior of China is not that of a normal country and that it was interfering in domestic affairs. He also demanded that the Chinese ambassador to South Korea immediately apologize and that China should focus on handling North Korea's nuclear issue instead of meddling in another country's parliamentary diplomacy. I have to say, this is probably one of the strongest comebacks I've ever heard uh, in recent memory. Right. <laughs> Basically, they, they don't don't even uh, interfere with our stuff here. Just go focus on uh, North Korea nuclear issues. How come you guys aren't doing anything in regards to this? But again, in the outside, it does seem like maybe China is being a little bit too sensitive with this issue, right? It's not like uh, the delegation went over to Taiwan and basically said, listen, guys, uh, we are standing by you. Uh, forget China. We're, we're taking your side. If there's ever a war, we're going to be taking your... It's not even... It doesn't even seem like the, the, the meeting is in regards to this, but because the Taiwan Strait, the Taiwan issue, the one China policy is such a sensitive topic right now in two, from 2022 uh, to 2023 going into the new year here, that's why we're seeing very, very sensitive remarks uh, coming out from China. And then we had uh, lawmaker Cho kyung come back uh, with this remark. It's incredible. Uh, following China's response and uh, South Korea's response uh, towards that, uh, we even heard uh, Taiwan had some strong Strong remarks on Beijing's criticism towards Seoul. Uh, let's get more on that. So, uh, yes, uh, the Taiwanese foreign ministry slammed China's denouncement on South Korean lawmakers' visit. 
and I found that very interesting because uh, it's kind of a third country, again, making a comment towards one country making a denouncement against the yeah, other country. Yeah, it's, it's so confusing because we never see this, right? Mm. So the Taiwanese uh, foreign ministry called uh, China's behavior wolf warrior behavior. And uh, this uh, term uh, comes from actually a movie. Uh, it's a coined term from the Chinese action film Wolf Warrior 2 and the um, and the Xi Jinping administration's uh, kind of policies. Mm -hmm. uh, so wolf warrior diplomacy is kind of a confrontational uh, diplomacy uh, with um, proponents loudly denouncing and uh, perceived criticism of the Chinese government. So uh, so basically, if someone is saying something against Ch the China Chinese government, then China would act like a wolf warrior. Mm -hmm. I guess this is uh, a simple uh, uh, definition to that. So Taiwan said that the Chinese um, Embassy in Korea not only distorted the facts by calling Korean lawmakers' visit to Taiwan an unauthorized visit, but also violated Korea's national sovereignty and rights. And then the foreign ministry also appealed to countries uh, ideolog ideologically close to Taiwan to unite in condemning China's kind of bullying and vicious behavior. I have a feel again. I mean, this is um, we've seen this for uh, man. How long has it been since uh, the U.S. and China have been going into this like big, you know, tension? You know, the, the trade war is still going on, but there's been this the, the tension w between uh, the U.S. and China has been growing over time. I mean, it started sort of uh, before uh, during the uh, the Trump administration. It grew even more during the the Biden administration because. I mean, you know, Biden was actually even more hawkish against China. Uh, and now once that started, uh, you know, we're seeing basically uh, both UN, United States and China being sensitive at every little thing that involves each other's quote unquote uh, enemies. Right. And so you're seeing the U.S. basically making all these moves, even with the Inflation Reduction Act, it's, you know, trying to really call off China uh, and also China anytime that there's some kind of security uh, pact or some kind of uh, trade pact that involves the United States and excludes China they get really upset and so you're basically seeing two you know two people out there you know uh, in the mix of it and like you know South Korea is always that friend that's stuck in the middle here and uh, it's 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 getting ridiculous right now because to me still I don't know if it's because I'm not a, you know from the Chinese government but this this trip to Taiwan wasn't it shouldn't have been this big and it shouldn't have led to all these criticism from the uh, the Chinese government, to be honest with you. But how do you guys actually see it? Do you see Korea's delegation's uh, visit as a display of support for Taiwan in this issue or could that be? <laughs> I don't think that's what the meeting was about. Again, I mean, they you know, they talked about what the meeting was. Right. But it wasn't it wasn't like, listen, uh, if there is a war between uh, you know, if China, let's say, for instance, invades uh, Taiwan, we're with you. We're going to be sent. It wasn't even talks about that, I think. And it was, I mean, I we think, have relations mm -hmm. with Taiwan. And it's important to keep up with this, these diplomatic trips to keep that, keep the, the relations uh, close. I think actually then we maybe it would have been better if it was not a kind of discreet meeting. I think it was a discreet meeting because South Korea did not want to upset China, mm -hmm. knowing that China was going to be upset <laughs> over like a, a meeting that wasn't supposed mm. to upset them. Right. And then obviously they're saying, oh, if it's discreet, then what kind of secret stuff are you guys talking about? Right. Uh, but I think because it was a small meeting and discreet meeting, it was I think it was made in part. Uh, basically, South Korea and Taiwan said. Listen, let's try to keep this on the down low because we don't want to upset China because this is not really a big deal of a meeting, but you know they're going to get upset. So let's keep it on the down low here. But of course, it's going to get it get it in the media, right? And also the foreign ministry said anyway that they respect the one China policy. It's not that they disrespect it. So yeah, it South exactly. Korea needs to you know, strike a balance between that policy as well as maintain a relationship with China, Taiwan as well. Yeah, I think right now, uh, I think a lot of people, and you know what, in, in some ways, I kind of don't blame China for being oversensitive with a lot of this stuff. You have to take into consideration that for the past several years now, there's been a lot of attacks towards China, right? And so they're very sensitive. Anything that seems like it's going against them, they're going to go, oh, why Why is it because this is China? Why are, you, why are you doing this to us? Why are everyone enemies of China? And you kind of see this uh, with 
uh, even with the COVID-19 measures that are in place right mm. now, right? Uh, you know, now that China was late to the, uh, the the whole lifting of the measures and things like that, you're obviously going to see explosive cases uh, in China. And for obvious reasons, uh, many countries are going to start putting in restrictions. It's not that they're stopping them from coming in. They're saying, listen, just take the test. And then uh, if you test negative, then uh, we'll let you in. And this is also becoming a problem right now because China has been criticizing this. But speaking of which, we are going to talk about this because uh, there has been some... Uh, talks about whether or not the data coming in from China is transparent and accurate. Uh, there's been a lot of people kind of criticizing China's handling of the COVID-19 cases, but China is defending its virus strategy uh, amidst the uh, concerns uh, streaming in from around the world. So uh, let's get the details on Beijing's stance and also how, how the situation looks here uh, in Korea in regards to infections coming in from travelers from China. Right. So China is trying to explain or maybe persuade the world in that they will win the fight against COVID-19 despite the surging cases, although we don't have any official numbers because China is not reporting on them. But China's People's Daily quoted the government as saying, China and the Chinese people will surely win the final victory against the epidemic. Uh, the easing of um and they also said that the easing of China's infectious disease policy will uh, create an environment favorable to orderly exchanges between China and other countries and economic and social development. Uh, and China defending its handling of COVID-19 comes after a number of high-ranking people making remarks on how concerned they are. And one of those people was U.S. President Joe Biden. And also uh, the World Health Organization has been making uh, comments, although they usually are not that harsh towards China, if you have been re realizing throughout the pandemic. Oh, the World Health Organization yeah. has been in full support of China, even from the very start there. Uh, see, but but still, even the WHO recently, a high-ranking official uh, did mention that China seems to be under-reporting its caseload and especially the COVID-19-related deaths. Uh, I think just on uh, Wednesday, I don't have the most recent figures. They don't even, I don't think they report on the most recent they figures. They give you like weekly figures Yes, or but then like uh, I saw a report on Wednesday in mainland China, there was one death reported related to COVID-19, which seems to be an under report which also even the who is now uh here criticizing and uh, again not only u.s president joe biden but also the french health minister voiced concerns and uh, the german health minister as well so they are uh, more and more concerns regarding china's spread and that's of course because Chinese people also travel to other countries. And this is why there have been stricter measures uh, regarding uh, uh, entrance uh, to these countries, including here in Korea. And we know that just recently we strengthened the measures regarding uh, Chinese people or people coming in from China to Korea uh, at the airport. Uh, so if I give you a few um numbers regarding the latest infection trends, even though uh, the uh, people coming in from China have to get PCR tests before they arrive in Korea, still uh, people are getting infected. Uh, they test positive after they arrive because uh, the PCR test is being conducted 48 hours before they uh, come to Korea. So uh, the symptoms could come out later. And this is why uh, now we're seeing around uh, one out of eight people uh, that enter from Korea that are being um, uh, that test positive for COVID-19. But still, uh, the percentage of infected people has gone down recently. It was at over 30 percent uh, just around some weeks ago, but now stands at 12.6 percent. So that's because there are uh, restrictions in place. Yeah. yeah. So let's hope that uh, this will not lead to more, you know, domestic waves here as well. Um, I, you know, I know, uh, what is it, uh, China's foreign ministry spokesperson, uh, Mao Ning, I believe her name is, uh, she came out, she's been coming out in the press uh, quite a bit and basically saying that uh, this is a political manipulation by all these countries, uh, the United States and uh, the EU and so forth, because the data that they're supplying is scientific in nature and it's accurate and it's transparent and things like that. And it 
I mean, even from even when they had the zero COVID policy in place, it just I never understood how a country with that large of a population, despite the zero COVID policy in place, that they could have such low figures. Now, uh, I looked at a report uh, earlier today. This was a uh, a analysis from a, uh, a company called uh, Airfinity, and this is a, a British medical analysis company. And basically, what they said was that. The numbers that China is giving out is that they're seeing something like about like uh, cases in like the hundred thousand cases on a daily uh, d- d- daily figures is like something like a hundred thousand or something like that. But they're saying it's probably be two million a day that they're seeing infections, and the death figures are also much higher uh, that they're showing right now. Uh, I believe the hospitalization uh, rate. Uh, has jumped something like 50% over in China. But even that they're saying is probably not accurate. Mm. And so if China is not giving an accurate data, and like so I made a very good point in that, the WHO has actually been sort of shielding China from all this. And if they're coming out and saying that the data doesn't seem to fit what the situation is like in China, it's concerning. And uh, I forgot who it was. I think it was Kay, uh, one of our listeners, Kay, that made the point uh, yesterday that, I mean, China was sort of putting these measures in place from the get-go for all the other countries out there. And so when you were making, because China was basically saying, look, we don't have a COVID problem because of our uh, zero COVID policy, and we're going to shut down all the other countries from coming in uh, because you guys all have problems with COVID-19. Now that it's uh, the other side now, they're going, whoa, 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 why are you guys shutting us out? It's not even like they're shutting them out. It's just saying, you know, just, just test Take a PCR test, take a rapid antigen test, and if you test negative, then you're welcome to come in. It's easy as that. I don't know why this has to be political, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. SJ, you mentioned the um, the estimation that there could be some 2 million, two million cases. Yeah. And I think I saw reports also saying that in big cities already, like 70% of the right. people are probably mm-hmm. uh, 70 to 80% mm-hmm. uh, have been infected. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and again, China is a highly populous country, and so the numbers that you know they're giving out, it's just even an elementary school kid would basically say it doesn't make sense here. Uh, we're going to move on to the war in Ukraine because there was an interesting article that came out or a report that came out uh, basically that said uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin had apparently ordered a Christmas truce for 36 hours. Uh, Ukraine says, no, that never really happened. What is this about, Paul Young? Right. So as you just said, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered a ceasefire by Russian troops in Ukraine over the Orthodox Christmas on January 6th to 7th. The ceasefire will kick in for 36 hours starting at noon on January 6th. Then why January 6th? It's because Orthodox Christmas is traditionally celebrated on that day. It's the first official truce order since last February when Russia invaded Ukraine. According to Kremlin's statement, Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, called for a truce out of respect for the Orthodox Christmas holiday, and Putin had apparently responded to Kirill's plea. Kremlin urged Ukraine to declare a ceasefire and give people the opportunity to attend services on Christmas Eve and on the day of the Nativity of Christ. However, Ukraine rejected Russia's truce, saying that Russia must leave the occupied territories to have a temporary truce at all. Podolyak, an advisor in the office of Ukrainian President Vladimir no, Volodymyr Zelensky said on Twitter that Russia should keep hypo- hypocrisy to itself. He also criticized that Kirill's appeal was a cynical trap and an element of propaganda. Bo Gyeong, you, you've never been a hypocrite yourself, right? Uh, which is why uh, hypocrisy is the word that <laughs> yes, you... That is, <laughs> hypocrisy is not in Bo Gyeong's dictionary. No, it isn't. And that is a, <laughs> fant- <Hopefully not. laughs> that is a fantastic <laughs> thing here because nobody likes hypocrites, right? Let's turn to the United States because this is interesting. I have never seen this ever happen here. The United States, they still could not elect their House Speaker. This is the longest speaker contest in 164 years. That's why years you here. never saw this happening yes, before. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I am not this old here. And uh, it's incredible. I've lost count. I, I was watching this from like the morning and it was like, I think it was like the ninth vote when I was watching it and I just got tired of it. And even <laughs> when the voting was going on, there are people with their uh, tablet PCs and their uh, books and all these people who are basically the, the you know the Congress people they're uh, voting 
They're reading books. <laughs> they're they're tired of this too. It's going nowhere right now. So uh, let's get the latest details yes. of the House Speaker situation here. Right. I found it very interesting as well because apart from presidential elections, I'm not really like familiar with the politics in the U.S. But uh, yeah, the recent news has been really interesting for the rest of the world too, I believe. So the House entered a third consecutive day of the new Congress on Thursday local time without a new speaker. And probably this will drag on for more days. Uh, SJ, you said you lost track. It was actually the 11th attempt to elect the Republican leader of the House of Representatives, Kevin McCarthy, which has failed again. Uh, The House was adjourned till noon after a motion was passed 219 to 213. And they're going to reconvene on Friday, which actually is also marks the second anniversary of uh, former U.S. uh, President Donald Trump's supporters riot. Uh, if you believe, uh, remember. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so I like how the BBC um, titled the, the, the latest news, three days, 11 votes, still no U.S. House Speaker. I think that wraps it up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And the interesting thing here is, I don't know if you guys know the, the order of succession for who becomes president after, if let's say Joe Biden passes away, uh, next in line would be Vice President Kamala Harris, the right? The third mm-hmm. is the House Speaker. Ha- House Speaker, which would have been interesting if, Again, if Kevin McCarthy would be able to get the Mm. significant number of votes. Uh, But fourth in line is, I've never heard this title before. It's the President Pro Tempore of the Senate. And uh, it's uh, a Senator Patty Murray. And uh, she she would be... (laughs) Third, mm-hmm. uh, second, basically second in line uh, because they don't have a, uh, a house speaker just yet. Yeah, I'm learning new things because, mm-hmm. again, I have never seen this ever because <laughs> it's been 164 years. Guys, thank you very much for coming in today with your reports. Please have a safe weekend, and we'll see you guys again next week. Thank have you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.